any rate, let's begin. So, um, let me start off by saying that uh, I made uh, apologizing for a little bit of an error that I uh, made during the last lecture. Uh, when conveying bloom filters, I did not precisely specify, or at least I did not specify precisely enough uh, how the bloom filter is constructed. I mentioned that it was cr constructed using a hash function, but um, after further investigation, uh, in particular, uh, several students asked me to explain some of the math behind it. Um, after kind of investigating a bit, a bit more, uh, I'd like to clarify a point that I made, um, specifically that uh, the way that the bit vector for a given record is generated. Um, so the way that a bit vector gets generated for a bloom filter uh, is that given some m bit array of uh, bits, uh, for every record, a fixed number of bits are set to one. So the hash function uh, is, is not actually used to set each individual bit. The hash function is used to pick which set of k bits to set to one. Um, this in particular makes a lot of the math uh, much simpler. Uh, and it in particular explains how the uh, number of uh, records that end up getting um, number of the records, uh, it can remain proportional to the number of bits in the bit, bit vector. Uh, so that said, uh, since several people asked about it, I'm going to do a brief run through of uh, how exactly we come up with this, this idea that uh, for, uh, if I have n records, uh, sorry, if I have, that should be an m, Uh, if I have n records, uh, how, do I get up, how do I get this uh, mysterious number m, the size of my bit vector? So uh, first off, uh, let's start with some basic probabilities. So what's uh, the probability, let's look at one bit, one hash function, what's the probability that that one uh, hash function will set a single bit to one? Hmm? Uh, one, by one by m. Yep. So one by m. All right. Let's uh, let's refine that. Um, what uh, what about the probability that one bit is not set to uh, is not set to one? One minus. Okay. Good. Still simple. Uh, okay. Now I have. Let's say that I have k hash functions. What's the probability now that that one bit is uh, going to remain unset? One minus k by m, or so I, the the probability that uh, I don't set a bit is that if I have k functions, then I have to run that test k times. So what does that get me? K my uh, so is it multiplication or what's the if I have uh, two coins? Is it uh, if I have two coins? Uh, the probability of getting a heads is one half uh, on each coin. I end up, uh, how do I compute the probability of getting two heads? Two uh, I, it's not I multiply by two, I uh, compute the, the uh, uh, I raise to the power of two. So for k tests, I get one minus uh, one to, uh, over m to the k. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, let's say that I, that I have, okay, so now I have one bit. I, this is the probability that that one bit stays zero after k, uh, k trials. Now, I have k hash functions. I also have n records. So how many, uh, how do I get uh, the chance that it remains zero after n records? It's the same thing. Uh, yeah, well, uh, same thing, I just raised that whole thing to the power n. Everyone following? Any questions up to this point? So that's, that's one bit, k hash functions, n records. All right, so now, um, 
I have these k bits, I have n records. Uh, for a given record, I have k bits set. So assuming that all of those bits are the same, making a couple of independence assumptions that aren't strictly speaking true, how can I approximate the uh, chance that all of its bits are going to be set? Or how, uh, let me back up. Uh, what is the chance now that a given bit that I'm trying to test for won't have been set by n records? So this is basically uh, the inverse probability of this, the, the probability that this event doesn't happen. One minus, one minus okay. Uh, so one minus that. So one more step. Um, I have to repeat this trial k times because, uh, well, there are k bits in the, that I'm testing for. And what, it, what I'd like to know is the probability that all of the k bits that I'm testing haven't, have not yet been set by at least uh, one of the records in, in this set. So once again, I raise to the power uh, k, and now I have this nice little complex, uh, fairly ugly, uh, maybe not so nice function that tells me uh, this is the probability that uh, this is the probability that I run into a false positive. That I, that I identify a record that is not in the set, sorry, that I decide that a record is in the set when it actually isn't. Just the random happenstance of the bits that get set uh, turns out to be uh, the same as the record's bit vector. Okay, so uh, the math behind this is still fairly nasty, so I'm not gonna go through the precise math for this, but this is, this is the probability, approximate probability that uh, I get a false positive. And what I'm interested in is kind of minimizing the chance of a false positive. I'd like to come up with some input parameter that minimizes this probability. Um, the math for that, as I said, is a, a bit complex. So rather than trying to go through that, I'm just gonna try and demonstrate to you uh, by visual uh, representation that, uh, my pointer, uh, by visual representation that the uh, minimum is actually uh, linear with respect to the number of records. So you can, what I have graphed here is that function with a fixed ratio of records uh, to size of bit vector. And what's getting graphed is uh, the number of bits that get set. So that's one of the things that I, I have to play around with uh, to minimize the thing that I, uh, the value that I'm trying to compute. And as you can see, that uh, minimum point kind of grows uh, with respect to the number of, uh, with respect to the ratio of um, size of bit vector to number of records. Each of these lines, uh, which you really kind of can't see, uh, but each of these lines here corresponds uh, down there, up there, uh, corresponds to one particular ratio of uh, size of bit vector to number of records. So as I grow that ratio, uh, the number of bits that I need to set grows linearly with respect to, uh, to that ratio. Now what that implies is that, uh, well, the, the size of the, the number of bits that I need to set is proportional to the ratio of the, the bit vector, but more importantly, with that, jiggle that around a little bit and get that the number of records uh, is, uh, the, the size of my bit vector uh, is proportional to the number of records that I need to create, where C here is just some arbitrary constant that uh, we can compute. In other words, uh, as I grow the number of records, the, uh, the size of this bit vector that I need to create grows linearly. Uh, any questions? So kind of the intuition here, uh, just to uh, point this out, the intuition here is that uh, there, there are two exponentials here, but those exponentials are um, expon on uh, values that are less than one. So as the, uh, as the number 
as the number of records grows, the uh, effectively the uh, this function ends up having that nice little minima. Okay, uh, right. So moving on. All right. So one other uh, little bit of recap that I wanted to do uh, today before moving on. Uh, I wanted to kind of cover a, a few uh, bits of confusion that we uh, came up with uh, in assignment four. So uh, basically, to recap, uh, with two-phase locking, um, there are basically well, two phases, two-phase locking, two phases. Um, in the first phase, you acquire locks and only acquire locks. In the second phase, you release locks and only release locks. Um, in the general, in this general notion of two-phase locking, when the switch uh, happens between these phases is kind of arbitrary. Um, in most modern uh, implementations of two-phase locking, all of the locks get released at the very end. This is this makes things uh, much easier to implement, and this is known as strict two-phase locking. But in general two-phase locking, uh, it Kind of where you transition from phase, excuse me, phase one uh, to phase two is kind of up to uh, up to you, really. Um, now, why have this crazy idea? Well, uh, basically, the idea of two-phase locking, the reason that this uh, that the two-phase locking kind of makes sense, is that there's this. Uh, it makes the way that you acquire locks monotonic. Um, during each phase, you're either growing the number of locks that you hold or shrinking the number of locks that you hold. And this kind of uh, monotonicity has been kind of long since known uh, in any distributed or concurrent system to be a really nice property uh, because it means that the system is predictable. Uh, it means that the system kind of can't go back, um, can't go back to an earlier state, which is uh, really useful when you're trying to synchronize multiple processes. Um, just to kind of hammer this home a little bit, uh, this kind of interaction, while it is a valid use of locks in general, uh, is kind of the exact thing that two-phase locking doesn't permit. As soon as you acquire a lock, um, uh, sorry, as soon as you release your first lock, you can never acquire any lock uh, whatsoever from that point on. Um, as an aside, could, this, uh, could the schedule that I have presented here be generated by uh, two-phase locking? I'm seeing people say no. Uh, why do you say yes? Or what, what would it take to get this uh, schedule or how, how would I need to rearrange the locks to get the schedule into two-phase lock uh, to support two-phase locks? So I'm seeing people say, uh, shake their heads no. And um, basically, that's, uh, that's the case. If I perform a write, oh, sorry, if uh, all that I'm allowed to do when deciding whether a uh, schedule is supported by two-phase locking uh, is decide where I place the locks and release statements. And in this particular case, there's no way that I can uh, assign uh, locks in such a way that this particular schedule would be generated. Um, now, what I could potentially do if I were actually running this is swap the order of execution of these two operations, and that is how I could potentially execute this in a way that would be compatible with two-phase locking, but the result would be a different schedule. Um, running the write, uh, transaction one's write before transaction two's write, that is a different ordering of operations. That's a different schedule, and uh, as a consequence, that's not uh, equivalent to this schedule. So in short, uh, the schedule couldn't be generated by two-phase locking. Um, one other uh, bit of confusion that we noticed was on view serializability. Uh, oh, that was supposed to be animated. Damn. Okay. Uh, 
was on view serializability, and it was based on this observation that uh, what is observable. So view serializability uh, kind of makes this observation that as long as a uh, operation isn't visible outside of the given transaction that performs it, it's fine. Um, and in this case, uh, so if I have a, a write, if that write can be seen by anything outside of that one transaction, in other words, uh, if that write is not only seen in the final database, but also uh, if that write can be seen in, let's say, transaction two's uh, read set, then, um, then that write uh, is, is no longer eligible for kind of being hidden. It's no longer hidden uh, if transaction two reads it. So let me give you an example of that. Let's say I have the following schedule. Uh, transaction two performs uh, a write. Transaction one performs a write. Uh, transaction uh, one then performs another write after transaction two performs a read. Now nominally this schedule wouldn't be uh, view serializable. Um, because, well, transaction, uh, sorry, nominally the schedule uh, wouldn't be uh, serializable, and it's still not view serializable, because the value that is read by transaction two over here uh, is kind of this intermediate value. There's no way that a serial ordering um, could possibly see this value A2, because af uh, before uh, transaction one executes, it's whatever was there before the write. After transaction uh, one executes, uh, the value is A3. So this kind of A2 value is an intermediate result. And I could never, uh, that value could never uh, possibly have been visible outside of that individual transaction, assuming that the transaction executes uh, in isolation or in a serial order. Any questions? Uh, so transaction one produces a, uh, I, I'm not sure if I understand precisely what you're, you're trying to ask. Uh, the value being written is important. So, uh, you're, uh, if I understand correctly, your, your claim is that this is potentially view serializable? So, let me, uh, let me restructure. This is not precisely the assignment example, but let me give you a little bit let me give you a, a little bit of a, an example that might be a little more uh, illustrative. Uh, so this is uh, this schedule over here is a little bit more like uh, what is in the homework. Uh, now, transaction one, assuming it uh, it operates entirely in isolation, transaction one performs one write and then performs another write. So A goes conceptually through three different states. It's in state one before anything is written, it's in state two after the first write, and then it's in state three after the final write. Now assuming that we're executing these transactions in serial order, uh, then I might read it in state one, I might read it in state three, but I'll never read it in state two 
because that would require interleaving operations in my transaction. That said, what happens if I have another transaction show up and perform a write before transaction two reads, but after transaction one does its write? Is this schedule view serializable? So what's an equivalent serial? Uh, why is it not serializable? It is. OK, so what's an equivalent schedule to this? So T3 does its write. And what gets read here is the output of transaction 3. So in other words, this write by transaction 1 is hidden by transaction 3's write. I'm still never reading A in state 2. I'm reading A in the state that comes after uh, T3's write. And that's what view serializability is. It's this observation that there are certain cases where I can, uh, even if the conflict graph is, uh, has a cycle in it, there are certain cases where I can eliminate writes that get hidden by uh, other operations. And in this case, kind of what I'm doing to the, the, uh, the graph is this write is obscuring this write. So I can ignore that one, remove it from my conflict graph, and as a consequence, uh, it doesn't count towards it doesn't count uh, towards my uh, serial serializability uh, test. Any other questions? All right, great. Uh, all right, so moving on. Um, So that's basically the the um, the recaps and the uh, kind of going back uh, the material from from previous uh, lectures that I'd like to uh, recap. Um, what I'd like to cover today is a handful of topics related to uh, kind of distributed uh, concurrency and distributed query evaluation. Uh, there's not really much of a unifying theme between these, as much as I'd like to uh, to have one, um, but. Basically, there are a couple of other uh, things that don't really fit in anywhere else in, in the lectures. So, um, so let's start with the first one. Uh, whenever we're operating in a distributed setting and the, uh, the various participants uh, in a distributed computation uh, have some storage assigned to them, any time I, I perform a transaction that spans multiple nodes, I need to have some way to figure out whether all of those nodes are happy, whether they're ready to uh, commit, uh, whether I can uh, safely perform a commit. Uh, compute, uh, computing these kinds of uh, transaction conflict graphs is very easy when you're doing it at, on a single node, or, well, com uh, comparatively easy. Uh, but what I'd like to be able to do is take that same uh, local computation and now distribute it over multiple nodes. So concretely, uh, I'd like to be able to decide across multiple nodes when it is safe to commit a particular transaction. So let me give you, uh, uh, actually, before I move on, uh, what kind of problems might I run into in, in a distributed setting? If, if I'm trying to decide whether two different nodes are uh, in a consistent state. Yeah? OK, so there are uh, delays. Uh, and two different uh, participants in this distributed computation may receive messages in different orders. 
So uh, one participant uh, may, be, uh, may decide that one event happened first, one participant may decide that another event happened first. Uh, as an example, uh, one participant might decide that transaction two should have committed first, another participant might decide that transaction two, one uh, should have committed first. Okay, so ordering might be one, uh, is one thing that we need to watch out for. Uh, what else? What about dinosaurs? You laugh. All right, so uh, let's say that we have a, a set of uh, participants. Uh, let's break them up into logical uh, components. Uh, some physical hardware performing a coordination task, some physical hardware uh, performing the role of node one, and some, other, some different uh, physical hardware uh, performing the uh, role of node two. So uh, coordinator one performs a write, and that write needs to get reflected on two different uh, physical devices. So it's going to send a message uh, to both of those devices and then uh, ask itself, can I assume that that write was safe, uh, safely uh, written to node one and two? Can I? No, why not? Okay, so I need to, some sort of acknowledgement uh, because well, yeah. So the the systems at the other end may uh, they're operating on their own. They may not uh, be there. They may be down. Uh, the network might be broken. Uh, so there might be some uh, there might be something going on there. So let's say that we actually integrate into our protocol some sort of acknowledgement. Uh, so node one uh, performs, uh, sorry, the coordinator performs a write, sends a message to both node one and node two. Node one and node two acknowledge it. Is it safe to commit now? Yes. Uh, so I've gotten a response from both of those. Um, now, what if I don't receive an acknowledgement from one of these nodes? Now, conceptually, I've kind of written, uh, what are kind of the two possibilities for uh, if I don't receive a, a acknowledgement from node two? Okay, so node two might have failed, or the message might have gotten lost. So. Like I said, dinosaurs might have come along and eaten the message for after node two uh, sent it back or before node two. But, and we don't know precisely where the dinosaur came along, so it's not safe to commit. Uh, and we'd like to come up with a uh, protocol that kind of coordinates uh, this uh, message, uh, this acknowledgement system. Um, now, what's the, why do we care where in this process uh, the message gets lost, assuming all of the components are working. Is there a difference between these two cases? Okay, so we could send it again. We could keep uh, trying to send the message to uh, node two. Let's say this dinosaur is really hungry. It, it just keeps eating those messages as we send them. Or worse still, what happens if one of those messages gets through and then uh, node two writes its uh, writes what it was going to write, and now we can't get in touch with node two anymore. So, better uh, another way of phrasing that: uh, the coord after excuse me after the coordinator gets uh, a message back from node one and two it's safe for the coordinator to decide that uh, the whole protocol was executed successfully. But is it safe for the nodes to decide that the protocol was executed successfully? Okay, so now I could potentially have the coordinator send back a message to all of the nodes saying, okay, everything's com uh, completed successfully. But what happens if that message gets dropped? <laughs> 
Can the coordinator decide that the nodes got that message? No. So basically we need some way of deciding where to stop in this great cycle of things. And more importantly, we need to have a way of precisely expressing where um, kind of this authoritative uh, version of the commit is, uh, is residing. So we're kind of going to use the coordinator as the focal point. And we're going to assume that the nodes, uh, we're going to uh, ensure that the nodes uh, don't take any action that could violate an assumption that the, coordina that the coordinator has, but that they can still uh, kind of operate independently. So there's this protocol uh, called two-phase commit. As the name implies, there are two phases. Uh, this, by the way, has absolutely nothing to do with two-phase locking, two completely separate things. Uh, stupid names. Uh, so we're going to pick one of the participants. We can have as many participants as we want. We're going to pick one of them to, uh, to serve as a sort of coordinator. And how that happens, well, there's a number of different protocols. We're not going to get into those. Uh, there's a number of different systems out there that will do this for you as well. Uh, Zookeeper uh, is, is used pretty frequently. Um, so for every transaction, we pick one coordinator to decide whether uh, everything should be committed. And the basic protocol is actually very similar to the protocol that I presented uh, just before. This, uh, the coordinator is going to send out a message to each of the uh, participants saying, I would like to commit. Um, and then each of the nodes is going to kind of enter a state where it uh, decides first off whether it is possible for the transaction to commit. It's going to do its own local, uh, uh, local conflict graph test and decide whether locally uh, the transaction can safely commit. Once it decides whether it's uh, safe to commit it locally, it's going to send back a message to the coordinator saying, yes, I think it's safe. No, I don't think it's safe. But what's more important is that as of the point where it sends this message, it's going to treat the transaction as having entered whatever uh, state it decided on. It's going to locally uh, decide that the transaction has committed, uh, sorry, if it dis locally decides that the transaction has aborted, then it's immediately going to abort the transaction. It's going to undo whatever it did locally, and it's going to basically assume that that transaction has aborted. Because, well, if any of the nodes uh, don't think it can continue, then it won't continue. If the transaction, uh, if the local node decides that the transaction has committed, then it's kind of go going to enter this weird limbo state. Uh, and in, in this weird limbo state, uh, it's not going to take any actions that could possibly cause the transaction to abort. So, Basically, it's going to kind of hard code this, this uh, status. And then it's going to inform the, the coordinator of uh, whatever it decided on. Now, once the coordinator receives all of the, uh, the confirmations from all of the nodes participating, it can then inform the nodes that uh, whatever task uh, has completed and is successfully going to abort, or it's now going to, sorry, successfully going to commit, or it's going to abort. So this is kind of the, uh, the coordinator, this is the protocol I described before, with one extra message from the coordina coordinator to each of the nodes. So what are the possibilities here? If the coordinator has, uh, once the coordinator has decided that the operation has committed, the operation has committed. And the individual nodes are responsible for making, uh, for trying to get in touch with the coordinator and, and make sure that the coordinator is able to, uh, making sure that uh, getting in touch with the coordinator to decide whether the coordinator has, uh, what the, the coordinator has decided on. But because uh, a node in this weird limbo state uh, that's not quite a commit 
because a node enters this weird limbo state that's not quite a commit, the, uh, it actually it can no longer, it, it is no longer feasible for that node to abort, and as a consequence, we can't get ourselves into, into any trouble here. It may be in this weird limbo state, but it's only in this weird limbo state until it finally contacts the coordinator. It finally gets in touch with the, the coordinator. Um, and well, presumably that will happen eventually. OK. Um, yes? Okay. Okay. So the question is, if the uh, what happens if the the question is, if I understand you correctly, uh, that uh, you would like to know whether uh, this is this protocol is used to determine the success of a single transactions commit or the uh, success of a set of transactions committing. Um, part of uh, what I understood your question, or part of what you said uh, during your question, if again, uh, if I understood correctly, was that the, uh, it sounded like you were assuming that each transaction uh, is performed on a single node. Um, if a transaction is performed on a single node, the single node can decide entirely by itself whether or not the transaction was successful. Um, Two-phase commit enters into the picture when uh, a single transaction accesses or modifies data on multiple nodes. So if I have to decide between two nodes, when is it safe to commit the transaction but that transaction performs operations on two different nodes, then I need some way of uh, getting those two nodes to agree on, uh, yes, the transaction committed, no, the transaction did not commit. Does that address your? Right, so it's um, two-phase commit is what's called a consensus protocol. Uh, the idea is that the two nodes need to pick a value and agree on it. In this case, the value is yes, commit, or no, abort. And there's some uh, no occurs if either of the nodes decide uh, no. But both the nodes will know that when the transaction is, when the part of the transaction that they are executing is over. Uh, each node will know when the uh, part of the transaction that it is locally uh, uh, executing is, is complete. Uh, the question is, uh, so the, the, the question is, what happens if the transaction needs to abort? So if node one performs its bit of the transaction successfully, is it allowed to commit the transaction at that, uh, at that point? Yes, each node has a limited number of transactions of operations to perform. So does each node know that whether it has completed all the operations of the transaction or not? Um, so each node can figure out that it has locally performed all of the trans uh, the operations that it needs to perform successfully. Uh, what it can't immediately figure out is whether the other participants in the computation have completed their parts successfully. So if node one completes its part, it's still reliant on uh, determining whether node two has completed its part successfully. And uh, this protocol, the goal is to uh, have a sort of election to uh, each node uh, casts its ballot. Yes, I was able to complete my operation successfully. No, I was not able to complete my operation successfully. And then the coordinator kind of takes all of these ballots and figures out whether all of the nodes unanimously decided that they have successfully completed their part of the transaction. And the nodes themselves can't 
can't proceed really. They, uh, as long as uh, the, the, uh, they have not yet heard from the, the coordinator, um, they can't really decide whether or not the transaction was successfully committed or not, unless they themselves locally decided it's not. Uh, as far as two-phase commit is concerned, it doesn't matter uh, whether it doesn't, uh, to repeat the question, uh, do the nodes have uh, copies of the, da the entire database? It doesn't matter. Um, we'll briefly touch on replication, but uh, the only thing that matters here is that there is some uh, part of the computation that is performed by node uh, two. There's some part of the computation that is performed by node one, and they, the two nodes want to agree, yes, the transaction, every piece of the transaction committed successfully, or no, every piece of the transaction did not commit successfully. Does that address your concern? Any other questions? Yes? So there's no signal back to the coordinator after the commit? So there are three total messages per node. Uh, the question is, there's no sig uh, is there no signal uh, back to the coordinator? Um, to answer, there are three uh, total messages per node. The coordinator, uh, the coordinator first informs the nodes. Here. The coordinator first informs the nodes uh, uh, to. Oh, well, actually, let's call this prepare. The coordinator first informs each node, prepare. And this basically says, OK, all of the nodes have completed their piece of the transaction. Are you ready to commit? Then the nodes basically send back their ballots, yes or no. And then the coordinator tallies the votes and says to each of the nodes, yes or no, again, depending on what it got from each, each of the individual nodes. Now the, the important bit is that on the side of the node, there's this intermediate state where it's decided that the node, ha uh, if, it if it sends back a yes, as of this point, as of the point where it sends back a yes, it is no longer allowed to take any action that uh, could potentially make the transaction abort. As of this point, the transaction has successfully committed. And then once the node, sorry, a, as of this point, the transaction has successfully, uh, has to be treated as if it's successfully committed. And then as of this point, the node can then finalize that decision. Um, so to answer your question more directly, yes, the coordinator sends back a message saying, yes, I committed, no, I did not commit. And the node's receipt of that message indicates that uh, it is now safe to, uh, it is now safe to um, write its uh, state to disk and start serving that state to other transactions. So would there be a physical change on the node between two and three? Uh, would there be a physical change on the node between two and three? Uh, what do you mean by two and three? Uh, between once it's after prepared and it says a yes, and once it's a yes. Uh, or, what do you mean by physical change? Uh, so if it never receives the acknowledgement to commit? Uh, so what ha uh, the question is what happens if it never receives uh, an acknowledgement to commit? Um, oh, then it would report. Right. Uh, if it never receives this acknowledgement, then it would keep trying to tell the coordinator that, yes, I, uh, it would keep try retrying this particular part of the protocol as long as the coordinator has not sent back a response. Uh, but as soon as it sends that first yes, it's no longer uh, possible for that node to perform any action that, uh, or it's no longer allowable for that node to perform any action that could potentially cause the transaction not to commit. 
if it sends back a yes. Um, in other, uh, so if another transaction came along that accessed the same set of resources, uh, that transaction would have to wait for this transaction to complete, as an example. Does that address your concern? 